Good morning and welcome to our second service on Sunday mornings. We have two services, the first of which is the Bible prophecy update that we do weekly, and then now the second service, which is the sermon where we're going through the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we're currently in the amazing book of Hebrews. And our text today is going to be Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 7, and we're going to make it all the way through to verse 7. So one verse. <laughs> I know we could do this. So for those of you that are here, if I could trouble you to stand, if you're able, if not where you're seated is fine. You can follow along as I read the lengthy text before us today. Actually, you'll see why I hope here in a moment that we're only taking this one verse today. The writer of Hebrews is writing by the Holy Spirit and says, verse 7, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Let's pray if you would please join with me. We'll ask God's blessing on our time together in His Word. Loving Heavenly Father, would you at this time, as only you can and are always faithful to, just settle our hearts and quiet our minds, silence all the clamoring voices that compete for our attention, and keep us from giving you our undivided attention. Lord, just help us to focus and concentrate on that which you have for us today here in your Word. Lord, we need for you, we are desperate for you to speak into our lives in and through your Word, especially in this day in which we are living today, as things just grow increasingly worse, seemingly by the day. Lord, as we now look at what it was like in Noah's day, and how it compares prophetically to our day. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us, your church, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So I want to talk with you today about the prophetic and stunning, and I mean stunning, similarities with how the world today is just like it was in Noah's day. And the reason is because the writer of Hebrews is going to reacquaint us with Noah, this man of faith, as he continues with what we affectionately refer to as the Hall of Faith. I really sought the Lord this last week in preparation for the teaching today, and I, I really am looking forward to Abraham, who's next, by the way, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, I tried, Lord willing, that's next week, but I just sensed from the Lord that He would have us to look at and talk about Noah more specifically the days of Noah. And if you'll kindly allow me to, I'll first share with you the similarities, then explain the prophetic implication and application to our lives. In order to do that, we're going to need first to revisit what the days of Noah were like because this is going to be germane to our understanding of our text. 
I'm keenly aware that I run the risk of an oversimplification when I say this, but I say this nonetheless. You can basically sum up Noah's day in three ways. Namely, the population of man, the wickedness of man, and the genetics of man. All of which are recorded for us in Genesis 6. I'll encourage you to join me there in chapter 6. I'll begin reading in verse 1. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, that's the population, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then, verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim, verse 4, were on the earth in those days. Some of your translations render them as the giants. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes, some of your translations render it, mighty of old, men of renown. The Lord, verse 5, saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. That's the wickedness of man. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's uh, interesting. Would you uh, allow me to kind of paraphrase what we just read there? Because that's kind of full, that verse, a little bit. In other words, Every thought, the imagination, the creative imagination, the inventing of evil on the part of man, the thoughts of man, the thinking of man, the human heart of man was only always evil, always only. I know that's not proper sentence structure, but you get the point. They had become so wicked, so evil. I, I, I remember when we were teaching through Genesis, this is many years ago now, when we started in the Old Testament on Thursday nights. And when we got to chapter 6, I remember just really studying hard, rightly dividing the word of truth, particularly with this chapter. It's kind of a gnarly chapter. Would you agree? And I have this thought that the wickedness and the evil of man in Noah's day, according to verse 5, was such that they would look for new ways of wickedness. You'll forgive the the silliness with which I illustrate this, but they would get up in the morning and the first thought that would come to mind is, I wonder what wicked evil I can do today. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry for that. If you have a better illustration, I'm more than willing to hear about it. They had become so wicked, so evil, so perverse, it was actually for this reason that God destroyed the earth in the days of Noah, and this by way of a flood. Dare I say that the human DNA 
had been corrupted. If you'll allow me to, I'll explain how I get there. We actually see it beginning in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This, verse 9, is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect. And by the way, that word in the original carries with it the idea of intact. He was a just man, intact in his generations, which in the original language carries with it the idea of his genetics, genetically, generationally. So let me reread that verse. Noah was a just man, intact in his genetics, generationally. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth, verse 11, was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh, human, had corrupted human their way on earth. Okay. For those who are interested, we actually devoted an entire prophecy update to this back on December 13th of last year. We go into great detail about the comparison to Noah's day and our day, specifically as it relates to the altering of the human DNA. And that's all I'm going to say. And you know why. Okay. <laughs> now, question. What does this have to do with us? with where we're at in our day, today, <laughs> all of these generations later? Answer, it has to do with a prophecy from Jesus Himself about how the last days before His return will be like the days of Noah. Matthew chapter 24. Let me begin reading in verse 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Some Bible commentators suggest that in the original, this kind of carries with the, the idea of same-sex marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And I want you to hang on to verse 39. We're going to come back to it in a moment. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, in Luke's Gospel, we have the Savior saying basically the same thing, only in Luke's Gospel, He connects it with the days of Lot, and for good reason. Let me begin reading Luke 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then 
the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. By the way, let me parenthetically say Lot had to be taken out before the judgment could come down. In fact, in the narrative, it's really quite interesting in the detail that were provided. There was a hesitancy on the part of Lot, certainly his wife and daughters, by the way. And we're told that the angel of the Lord actually grabbed him and pulled him out, because he hesitated. The urgency being, we cannot let any judgment come down until you're taken out. You get the picture? So the comparison of the days of Lot to the days of Noah. Now we talked about this last week, because the hall of faith, or I know that's not a word, don't email me, <laughs> that we looked at last week was Enoch. <laughs> who walked with God, wait for it, <laughs> and then was no more, because God took him. He raptured him out before the judgment came down. Enoch, a picture of the church and the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And then again, there's interesting detail in the narrative. So Noah and his family, a picture of Israel, enter into the ark, and they are there for seven, I'm always careful with my fingers now, seven days. And then the judgment came down, a picture of the pre seven-year tribulation rapture of the church. In other words, and again, talking about Abraham, again, can't wait till next week. You have to come next week. If you don't come next week, we will come and find you. Actually, if you're, if you're not feeling well, we will not come and find you. You stay home. Um, but Abraham, you remember that account of him pleading with the Lord? Lord, certainly you're not going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, because his nephew's there. I mean, Lord, if there's 50 righteous, you're not going to judge it. No, I won't. And then Noah's, I mean, uh, Abraham realizes, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe I better lower that number, because there's probably not 50 righteous. So then he goes down the line. And isn't it interesting that when he gets down to that lowest number, there are still not that many righteous there? What's your point, Pastor? The righteous are not destined for the wrath and the judgment of God. When the seven year tribulation begins, it is the judgment of God that is poured out on a Christ rejecting world. And no judgment can come down until the church is taken out, like Lot. Now we've got ourselves a, a situation here. Can I say it like that? The situation is, we have this detailed prophecy from the Savior Himself, no less, that is comparing the days of Noah and the days of Lot to our day at the time of the end before He returns. Well, that's interesting. That kind of gives us an idea then. So all we have to do, we don't have to be the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer to do it, is start looking at what it was like in Noah's day. 
and let's compare it to what it's like in our day. The wickedness of man? Are you kidding me? Forget the population of man. They're working on that, by the way, trying to reduce that. God will have the final say on that, by the way. But how about the genetics of man? Perhaps it goes without saying, and I know we've talked about it in our prophecy updates, but you know what seals the fate and dooms and damns the one who takes the mark, right? <laughs> the book of Revelation is explicit that those who take this mark will be cast into the lake of fire. They are doomed and damned. There is no hope of redemption or salvation for them. Why? Because they are now outside the scope of salvation and redemption because they are no longer human. Their human DNA has been altered. Jesus became a man, human, to redeem man. That's why this whole Klaus Schwab fourth industrial revolution, great reset is about merging man with machine, transhumanism. And they're not even trying to hide it. I'm sorry, I'm yelling. That was the prophecy update. We'll save that for another time. That's why. And Satan knows it, that if he, like in the days of Noah, can corrupt the DNA of man, that man now is not redeemable. If he can corrupt the human DNA, as He did in Noah's day, in our day. That's what He's doing. And that's the why behind the what. That alone, stand alone, would you agree, would sort of seal the deal as it relates to the comparison of Noah's day to our day? One more thing on this. It's not in my notes, so it's too late on, at this point. <laughs> Moderna, we've talked about this, right? Mod, mode, RNA, modify RNA. You know what RNA is? RNA does all the work and DNA gets all the credit. The RNA goes to the parts of the body, the cells of the body. So you have a mRNA. It's got a message that the RNA takes into the DNA and using CRISPR like a scissors cuts out the human DNA and inserts what Moderna calls, by the way, the software of life. It's an operating system. Are we surprised? Are we surprised that one Bill Gates is the one who, you know, my first computer, 1982, don't do the math, I was two. Uh, it was a IBM PC clone. And it didn't even have a hard drive. It had those two big floppy disks. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you young people have no idea, just whatever. It didn't even have a hard drive. It, had this, it was huge. The monitor was as big as this pulpit. And it was slow. You stick that floppy in, that was the operating system. Then you put in the other one, that's the software. It was basically a glorified typewriter at that point. I'll never forget when I, when I got my first, when I upgraded, I got a 20 megabyte hard drive. Oh my goodness. I'll never fill that up. 20 megabytes, 20 megabytes. 
My oldest son uh, recently showed me a micro SD card. I mean, not, not an SD card, a micro SD card, okay? I mean, even my reading glasses with the strength that I have, not enough. I, could, I was like, what is this? It's one terabyte. Terabyte? Do you know how many gigabytes that is? It's one terabyte, a little itsy bitsy thing. Um, okay, I know I said that was one last thing on this. I got one more last thing on this. I truly believe that this is demonic intelligence, satanic intelligence. Oh, it's called AI, artificial intelligence, but <laughs> you don't think Satan knows the human genome and how to alter it? And all of this knowledge, knowledge, where do you think it comes from? The technology. And that's what's happening. Now see, in Noah's day, uh, didn't really have the technology as it were, but there was another way. It, he accomplished the same thing in Noah's day that he's doing in our day in a different way. Same thing, different means, same end. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's talk just a little bit about Noah and our text here in verse 7 of Hebrews 11. We're told that by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, had a holy fear. Stay with me. The holy fear was such that Noah, by faith, heeded the warning and built the ark to save his family as the heir of righteousness. By the way, some Bible commentators suggest that uh, his children hadn't even been born when he started building the ark. Let that sink in. Uh, and by faith, Again, when we get to Abraham, <laughs> by faith, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the sands on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And here's Noah, 99 years old. <laughs> that was an old prayer, God. You know, that ship has sailed. You know, look at Sarah. Oh, she's 90. You know, nope, I'm going to do it. Well, you better get going here because uh, we're kind of running out of time. The clock is ticking, as they say. That's faith. But we're told here that before Noah had children, he built this ark to save his children. He hadn't had his children yet. That's faith. There's a couple more things here too, as we're going to see in a moment. That holy fear, by the way, there's unholy fear, God's not given us a spirit of that fear, but there is such a thing as holy fear, the fear of the Lord. The proverb says that it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. And to fear the Lord is to hate evil. That was the holy fear that Noah had. And very interesting, by the way, let me just, before I forget this, it's not in my notes again. When Noah is first told to do this, God has not yet told him what he's going to do. In other words, Noah, I want you to build an ark, a boat. He hasn't told Noah yet that he's going to destroy the world and judge the world with a flood. So by faith, build an ark. Yeah, here's the dimensions, here's the materials, here's the specs. Here's the schematics, here's the blueprint. And he goes right to work, builds the, he has no idea yet about a flood. He has no children yet to put in there. He doesn't know yet what God's going to do. He just knows that God is going to do it. And the other thing is, he has no idea when God's going to do it. He just knows that God is going to do it. So by faith, he just does what God tells him to do. 
get this, 100 years. I'm just tired thinking about that. A hundred years. And could you imagine, he's building a boat on dry ground. It's not at a yacht club, there's no, you know, bay there, there's, no, he's building it on the ground, out in the middle of nowhere. Can you imagine? He was mocked and ridiculed till the cows came home. I don't know what that expression means, but you, you know what I'm talking about. And yet, by faith, in His faith and righteousness and all add obedience, did it. Could you imagine the Noah jokes going around during that time? <laughs> How many Noah's does it take to change the light bulb? He's heard them all. Hey, can you imagine the, the dialogue as he's building this thing? What are you doing, Noah? Oh, I'm, I'm building an ark. What's an ark? Well, it's kind of a, a boat. What's a boat? Oh, it's a, a thing that will float in the flood. What's a flood? Well, a flood is, when, sounds like a little three-year-old asking uh, their parents all these questions, right? Why is the sky blue? Because it's God's favorite color. That's the answer, by the way, when you have a child ask you that. What's a flood? Well, a flood is when rain comes down from the sky and floods the earth. Um, what's rain? Oh, you, you think I'm joking. I'm not. They had never seen rain before. And it's believed at that time there was a water canopy over the earth. And it was the dew that watered the earth. They had never seen rain before. This is where you need to take that verse out of your hip pocket, because Jesus said they had known nothing about up until the flood came. Think this through with me. Like with Noah in his day, so too is this true for us in our day, prior to the judgment of God coming down upon the world. They knew nothing about what's coming down from the sky, like we in our day know nothing about what's coming in the rapture when people go up into the sky. Let me say the same thing in a different way. They had never seen rain come down before. So here by faith is a guy building a boat for a flood from the rain that has never happened before. And he was a preacher of righteousness, by the way. And <laughs> here we are in our day. In a, in a sense, you could, you could see it and say it this way. We too are like Noah in our day, preaching righteousness that the rapture is coming. What's the rapture? Oh, it's when people are taken up into the sky. It's the same answer that Noah gave, only a little bit of a different context. What's a flood? Well, it's when rain comes down from the sky. What's a rapture? Oh, that's when people go up into the sky. Oh, come on! <laughs> I will, I, I'm sorry, I'm having too much fun with this, but a number of years ago I had a, a pastor actually ask me this question. He said, do you really believe in a secret rapture? Wouldn't you just love questions like that? The way they're couched and the way they ask it is kind of, you don't believe that, do you? 
that's what it was like. It was kind of like, and, and then what are you like? You're like, um, yeah, <laughs> no, way. are you, are you crazy? Uh, that's what they said of Noah. Isn't it interesting that when it happened, it happened, but it was too late. They were left behind. You see the connections here? So let's um, kind of try to wrap it up with this answer to that question. Are the days that we're living in today like the days of Noah? Absolutely they are. And now it's just a matter of time. You got the population of man, the wickedness of man, and perhaps more importantly now, the altering of the genetics of man, all three of which were chief and supreme and primary in Noah's day. In fact, some experts believe that the population of the earth in Noah's day was about what the population of the earth is today. You can search that on your own, by the way. I mean, we just got done reading it in Genesis 6, didn't we? That man increased on the earth. There are those that are, man, they've got a gift to be able to do that. They take the Scriptures and they calculate what the population could have been at that time, based on the genealogies. You know the genealogies, right? The parts of the Bible that we just skip. You don't want to do that in Matthew and Luke, by the way. So powerful, the genealogy of Jesus the Christ. And Matthew is a little bit different than Luke, both of which, I mean, prove, prove that He's the Savior. And you know, in particularly in Matthew's Gospel, I know I'm kind of getting off. I'll, I'll come back to the sermon already in progress, but this is really interesting. Uh, when we were studying through Matthew, this is a number of years ago too, Matthew chapter 1, you know, the, the so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, and then everybody's just like, oh. When you go back and you look at some of the names in there, you know what you're going to find? Well, first of all, get this, you're going to find women. <gasps> no! Yeah. This is unheard of. This is forbidden in the Middle East. You cannot come. The, the, the women were nothing. They were not even considered human. You know, the Jews had a, a prayer. <laughs> I'm getting way off, but I'm already way off. So <laughs> they would thank God that they weren't born a Gentile, a dog, or a woman. A woman. I'm so sorry, ladies. This, I, I'm just quoting to you what that in my culture, in the Arab culture in the Middle East, if a girl is born, everybody goes home. Ah, it's a girl. No, I'm, I'm serious. If a boy's born, party! Lasts for days. All the gifts. Why? Because the boy carries the family name. The girl doesn't. Growing up, I, my sister, poor thing, I mean, my parents very much held to the, the culture, the Middle Eastern culture. And I mean, boys are just so important and conversely, the girls are not in that culture, to this day, by the way, sadly. But in the genealogy of the Savior of the world, you have women there. You have prostitutes in there. No! You would think that the Savior of the world would come from noble birth. No. You go through that genealogy and you see who came, who the Savior came from. Why? Why do we have that 
recorded for us. And why would the Savior come from that lineage? Because <laughs> He came for the sick, the least, the last. He came as a Savior for man. And when you go through the Gospels, what you'll notice is that the Savior was attracted to those people. He would even go over to their house for dinner, and He would eat with prostitutes and tax collectors. These were IRS employees. No, for real, He would have dinner with them. Okay, back to our sermon already in progress. So let's just say for purpose of discussion that we've established that the days of Noah that we have described for us in Scripture are like the days that we're living in today. Are we good with that? Okay. Now what do we do with that? The Apostle Peter has the answer in his second epistle, chapter 3. I want to begin reading in verse 1. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 4 verse 5, and I want to, want to really draw the, your attention to this. They willfully forget, this is deliberate, that by the Word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water, and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. They willfully forget that. Some of your translations render it, they deliberately forget that God judged the world by a flood in Noah's day. But, verse 7, the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved not for a flood, for fire, until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Like Noah, judgment's coming. I'm going to use a flood to destroy the earth. Us today, fast forward, 
judgment's coming, I'm going to use fire to destroy the earth. How then ought you to live in light of that? Are you going to heed the warning like Noah with that holy fear, knowing what's coming? Because it's coming. In fact, it's here. It's that close. I think we are on the cusp of the rapture of the church. It is imminent. And the commencement of the seven year tribulation, at the end of which God will destroy the earth with fire and the heavens too. Why? Because sin entered heaven too. That's why Revelation 21 and 22 are about the new heavens and the new earth. Can't wait. Why don't you stand? We'll have the worship team come up. Lord, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord. It's getting so evil. The wickedness of man, so evil, so evil. And by the way, (laughs) we wrestle not against man, human, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness, wickedness in high places. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 delineates between four different entities in the spiritual realm. This is a spiritual battle. Your boss that is, whatever, he's not the enemy. He's the mission field. The enemy is the enemy. Your neighbor who gives you grief, (laughs) they're not the enemy. They're the mission field. My neighbor came over, I helped him out, and he said, I got my shots. I'm like, no. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for telling us, describing really in great detail, prophetically, what the world's going to be like at the time of the end, and comparing it to Noah's day, because we're looking around in our day, and I mean, it's exactly like it was in Noah's day, Lord. And that can only mean one thing, and that's that You're coming soon. Lord, I pray that we would seize every opportunity that is presented to us, that we would take heed with holy fear. And as the Apostle Peter asks the question, knowing these things, how then ought we to live? Oh Lord, thank You for Your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen.